Good morning, everyone. It's a wonderful time that we have to come and to gather and worship together this morning. And as we get ready to prepare ourselves for worship, I just want to remind you of a few things. Number one, uh, please be on the lookout for Josh's devotional and my devotional that we are doing, the One Word series, which will be on YouTube. So if you haven't subscribed, make sure that you subscribe so that you can get those. Another one I want to remind everybody about our giving, that we are asking that you mail in the giving as well. Um, if you choose to give, we know that it is a difficult time for many, and if you are not prospering, as 1 Corinthians 16 says, uh, we are to give as we prosper, we understand. However, if you choose to give, please mail it in or talk to one of our elders so that we can get a, um, a handle on that situation as best as we can. And in the same vein as that, if there's anybody who could connect to these sermons that are not, please let us know so that we can hopefully help them get connected in some form or fashion so that they can participate in this worship just as much as everybody else. We know there are a lot of people who are unable to, and uh, if you have any ideas for how we can handle that situation, please let us know to the best of our ability. We'll do what we can. We want to thank everybody for tuning in this morning, and as we begin to worship, I want to uh, let you know that Tim helped me out with the songs this week, so I hope that you enjoy hearing a familiar voice with that. With a, uh, without anything else to be said, we'll begin by worshiping in song. What a fellowship, what a joy divine leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear leaning on the everlasting arms? I have blessed peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. 
Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. It's at this time that we have the opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper together, and I know that this is um, always a time that we need to focus in on God. So as we pray and we think about these things, please clear your mind of the world around you and, and let's focus together as we partake of this. Let's pray together as we take thanks for the bread. Father in heaven, as we come and we see this emblem of the bread that you have commanded us to partake of, we ask, Lord, that you will clear our hearts to remember this amazing sacrifice that you made. We're thankful for the sacrifice of Jesus, that he willingly died on the cross, and this bread, which represents something so precious to us. May we be reminded of these things and understand the importance of them as we partake it of every first day of the week. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. At this time also, we have the opportunity to partake of the cup, and as we partake of this, let's pray to God that we remember this emblem appropriately. Pray with me, if you will. O oh, Father, our Creator and our Redeemer, as we partake of this fruit of the vine, may we remember the blood that was shed on the cross. May we remember its cleansing power and the love that poured out in agony as Christ was sacrificed for our sins. We thank you for this sweet communion that we can use as a time to examine ourselves and how your sacrifice impacts our lives, how we should live, and how we can live remembering all that you have done for us. May we take up this memorial in a way that pleases you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. I know that we aren't giving in the traditional way and we want to encourage you to still give if you can as you have prospered, but let's say a prayer uh, for our giving at this time as we come together in prayer. Uh, let us say a prayer for our giving at this time. Bow with me. Father, you know our hearts. May we give, Father, in a holy and acceptable way in your sight. Help us to understand our stewardship and what you require of us. Pierce our hearts with our giving, that it may not be routine and mundane. And we pray, Lord, that we will worship you with our giving. We pray that what we give will be used to further your kingdom and bring glory to you. We pray for our leaders. We ask that you give them wisdom in all the decisions that they make regarding this contribution and we thank you so much for the means that you have given us to give this in Jesus name I pray amen
I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, Dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. And I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath a cleansing flood. So here we are. It's uh, time for our sermon. And if you have your Bibles, I'd ask that you open them up to Matthew chapter 21 as we begin this morning. I want to talk about boot camp uh, as we kind of come to the end of our series here. We've been doing boot camp before we even started all this chaos. Uh, we've been doing boot camp. And so we're going to have our last sermon on boot camp before uh, we get into the next portion. But as the end of boot camp comes, uh, you know, I. I'd think about coming home. Uh, when boot camp comes to an end, I had you know several friends uh, who went off to boot camp who joined the military, and and I remember that you know what they did when they came home was they celebrated. Uh, they spent time with loved ones. They went out to eat. They enjoyed family and friends, and 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 it was a time of celebration. They enjoyed the time that they had. It was the reward for all their hard work. You know, as we come to a close of this series. I want us to stop and think about the spiritual boot camp that we've discussed, and it's time to celebrate. But it's not a time to sit on our laurels either, because just as you breathe a sigh of relief at the end of boot camp, you're called into service. That's the way that it works. Coming home from boot camp is most met with smiles and, and times of, of, of friends, but lot, not likely crowds. I don't know too many people who go off to boot camp that are I mean, so famous that when they come home from boot camp, they're met with just large swaths of people. Sure, maybe if they got a big family, they got quite a few people, but not crowds and crowds of people. But Jesus, on the other hand, when he came home, there were a lot of crowds. But that's just the way that Jesus was. Anytime Jesus went somewhere, there was usually crowds. Crowds loved Jesus. They followed him wherever he went. And often as he went, he had to try to escape the crowds just to get away, to spend some time by himself or with his disciples. Coming home to Jerusalem, though it was run by a crew that did not really like Jesus and were plotting to kill him, it was no different. The people there, or at least a lot of them, really loved Jesus. And when Jesus came home, it was with a great procession. We call it the triumphal entry often. 
And as Jesus came home, it started an uproar that would definitely make the Romans a little uneasy, especially because it might be like a military procession. Perhaps the disciples themselves even thought it would be like this because Thomas, when he was getting ready to go to Jerusalem with the crew, he said, you know, let us go die too. <laughs> now, I know that he was, it might not be in reference to that, but it could be because he knew that the uproar that they would start, whether it was the miracles that Jesus was performing or the things that Jesus was doing, he was going to the place of the enemy. He was going to the place where the, 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 the people who ruled, who were in charge, who did not like Jesus, where they had the most power, and that was Jerusalem. Now, considering this, Jesus is beginning to bring his ministry to a close as he comes closer and closer to Jerusalem. And I would like for us to talk about this grand entrance this morning as we come together and we think about this lesson. We're going to talk about uh, boot camp for the soul, celebrate and persevere. Celebrate and persevere. We're going to begin our, our reading this morning in Matthew chapter 21, starting in verse 1 and following, which tells the story of Jesus' uh, great procession. And so as we begin this, let's look together in verse uh, 1 of, of chapter 21. It says, Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, which is near Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus went or sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the full of a donkey. Does that sound familiar? It was actually from the reading this morning that we had earlier in Zechariah. That is a quote directly from there in verse 5 there. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought, them, uh, they brought the donkey and the colt and laid their clothes on them and set him on them. And very great multitudes spread out their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And when the multitudes who went up before and those who followed cried out saying, Hosanna, the son of David. Now, let's break that down very briefly. Hosanna, the son of David. Hosanna is a word that essentially means save or save us, God. Here, it's probably being used in a manner that is praising God, like, you know, save us, God, in a, in a praising manner, as if salvation is coming, especially when it's tied to the phrase, the son of David, Hosanna to the son of David, you know, save us, God, to the son of David. The son of David is a, a messianic term that they're using here for Jesus. This was known by many rabbis at the time in the earlier writings that this was refer in reference to the Messiah. And so as it is used here, um, they are referring to Jesus as the Messiah, number one, which is important. And number two, they are saying that through him, essentially, salvation is coming. Now, their version of salvation might not be what we know it as as Christians, because many people expected Jesus to become a king and actually rule in Jerusalem. Now, Jesus is a king. He's the humble king coming in on this donkey. But, I mean, he's not the king that they expected, and they would obviously see that. In spite of it all, people are still you know, praising him, and they are still having this wonderful scene where everybody is shouting, and, and they are singing, and they are doing these things. So it says, Hosanna to the Son of David, as the verse continues. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And it reads in verse 10. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? That way that the city is moved is, is not necessarily a pleasant one. It just talks about how they're stirred up. They are excited, perhaps maybe some at the thrill of, of the Messiah and some not really liking Jesus. But many people are asking the question, who is this? Some people knew him, but maybe they didn't know Jesus. Not like Peter did, who would earlier confess Jesus as Christ, but they don't know Jesus. They just know, hey, there's this Jesus guy. People talk about him. He does some miracles. But they didn't really know Jesus. So they're asking, who is this? Is he the Messiah for real? And some people are like, who is this? Who is this nobody? He's like a foreigner to us. Verse 11 says, so the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth, 
are from Nazareth of Galilee. So they recognize him as a prophet. They recognize him as from Nazareth of Galilee. But when they call him, you know, son of David, that's so much more. Now, considering all this, remember, I want you to remember the son of David and Hosanna and the importance of those things. And I want you to remember that the city has moved. This all has been leading to this situation. And I want to remember uh, verse 9 in Zechariah chapter 9, when it says, Rejoice, O greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation. Remember the Hosanna. Save, right? So save. His salvation is coming from this. So that's the other way that the king. Lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt the foal of a donkey. All right. So this king is coming. Right? We see him, son of David, a kingly messianic word. Salvation he has. Uh, Hosanna being the word that represents that. Then he says, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nations. And who else better to bring peace than the Prince of Peace himself, Jesus Christ? His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from river to the ends of the earth. So they thought that he was going to rule from Jerusalem in that way. And Jesus Christ does rule, just not necessarily from Jerusalem, the physical place, but he does rule from sea to sea and from river to the ends of the earth. That covers everything. The entirety of the world is being covered in the way that Jesus rules. And so we see in this boot camp for the soul, the people are coming and they're celebrating, but they need to persevere. Why? That's the question that we're going to tackle today. Why? Why does he need to persevere? Because it all leads to this. All their training that they've gone through throughout the ministry of Jesus Christ, this is the beginning of the end. As Jesus kind of strolls into town on this donkey and they have this great celebration, all of their ministry and pointing to who Jesus was and what he expected of his followers was about to be tested and put into action at the establishment of the church. This is the beginning of the climax of the story arc. God's plans are at work. Jesus has passed on knowledge and given them so much and he has prepared them for this. Jesus taught them, taught them how to live and, and the truths that they would need to get through it all. And it's wonderful that they get to end this in this great celebration, at least it would seem. But did it go like they expected? I'm sure it was thrilling to the apostles to see this, but perhaps they much more imagined him riding in on a war horse. Right? I mean, when you see these military processions and the coming in and the victory of, of taking over these towns, that's what they would use. And here comes the humble king on a donkey of all animals. But to have such a grand entrance and the celebration and the fanfare that came with that, I'm sure that would make anybody smile, including the apostles. Hearing the words, Hosanna and Son of David, surely brought them excitement. What these mean in, in some, actually quite a few I'm, I'm going to assume, knew is that they saw Jesus as Messiah and they saw him as salvation coming to save them. Boot camp was over. It was the time of celebration, but it wouldn't necessarily be long lasting because the time of trial was here for these people. Dark times were coming for them and Jesus prepared this for them. But the question is, you know, were they listening? You know, with all the chaos that's going on at this time and, and all the, 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 the weirdness of the coronavirus pandemic, I think that we've learned a few things. Number one, I think that we've learned that some people didn't do their job beforehand. Uh, for example, mask stockpiles from years ago were depleted and not replenished. And many of the words of the epidemiologists that were trying to tell governments all over the world to prepare for something like this, a lot of them apparently weren't taken that seriously. You know, I, I know that people said, yeah, sure, it's very, it's likely that this could happen, but people did not listen to that very seriously because they didn't prepare properly. Now people are trying to figure out after the fact what the best method is. And the truth is, is we all should know that this is new territory and we're kind of fumbling in the dark, making educated guesses. Now, but what happened, if, what would have happened if people had heard the cries of those who made warnings about the things that were going to come to place? Nobody could have predicted it exactly, but there were people who were saying, this type of thing is coming and we need to prepare. 
Do you think about how much easier perhaps maybe the crises could have been handled had we taken that cry a little bit more seriously? I'm not placing blame. It's not really the time for that. But to consider what it would be to have stockpiles ready for a, an event such as this, how much different a situation we might be in, how much different the news might be as well. For business to properly prepare for this as well, if people in businesses, small and great alike, had prepared for stuff like this, you think about how much easier it would be for them during this difficult time. Now consider this, the next time that something like this happens, how different will it be? Uh, because we've had time to think about it, radically different, I'm sure, because people will be more prepared. People will remember the mistakes that were made during this time and the shortcomings that were there and hopefully will learn from it. Jesus amply prepared his followers for the things that were about to take place. And had they listened, you know, hopefully, they would have probably been maybe a more emotionally prepared for a lot of what was going on because Jesus told them pretty bluntly. We go back and we look at some of the prophecies that Christ made on his death that was leading up to this. There's kind of three big ones that the Bible really talks about, especially in the book of Matthew. Now, several of these are listed and throughout the scripture, but I'm going to focus on these three particular in the book of Matthew since we're in the book of Matthew. And, and what we see is one of the earlier accounts of prophecies that Jesus gives after the impactful moment of Peter actually, you know, confessing Jesus as the Christ. Peter, in a moment of clarity that he's dealing with that, Jesus actually teaches his disciples after that moment the important truths of what was going to come. And listen to what Jesus says here in this moment. What he actually says here is, is it says, from that time, this is in Matthew 16, verse 21 and following, from that time, the time after, you know, they'd learned these things about Jesus because of what Jesus told them after Peter's confession, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised the third day. Wow, right? I mean, like, from that time, he began to tell them pretty clearly, it seems, what was going to happen. And it continues, it says, Then Peter took him aside from the beginning to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, that this shall not, ha this shall not happen to you. He he's going to try to prevent it. That's the type of man that Peter was. He loved the Lord, and he wanted to give his life, perhaps even to, if it would, to, to protect Jesus. But he turned, Jesus, and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. In other words, he's only thinking about himself. He's only thinking about the human aspect of these things, the worldly aspect of these things, not about the will of God that must be accomplished. And so he is not going to allow this to happen. And then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come into the glory of his Father and angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. That's an important you know, verse there. And if you think about what had happened there, it makes sense that Jesus taught them because they needed to know this. They needed to be ready. It wasn't a secret to them. You know, I, I would refer you back to the beginning of that. Like we said, the, from the time that Jesus began to sh as, as they discovered these things, as from that time forward, Jesus began to reveal these things to his disciples. Here's another example in Matthew 17, just a, a, a chapter later. Starting in verse 22, it says, Now when they were staying in the inn of Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up, and they were exceedingly sorrowful. So you see, they even began to mourn him already. They began to understand this situation already. And it would make sense that Jesus told them even about this betrayal ahead of time. It just further strengthens who Jesus really was. It further strengthens his deity that he is, you know, he knows the future. He knows what must happen. And so here as he talks about betrayal, death, and, and resurrection, I mean, look at verse 23. And he will be raised up, it says. And, and, and that's an important aspect. So let's look at the final example. 
This is in Matthew 20, just a, a couple chapters later. Actually, right before our reading today, it says, Now Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples aside the, on the road again. So he takes them aside and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. All right, he's preparing them for what we just read happened at the very beginning of our lesson. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. And deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and to crucify. And on the third day, he will rise again. I don't know how much more plain Jesus can make it, really, when you think about this. In this final example, we see him coming right before this morning's text and saying, I mean, pretty point blank, what's going to happen? He's going to be betrayed. He's going to be handed over to the chief priests and the Pharisees and the scribes. And they're going to deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. And he's going to die. But on the third day, he's going to rise again. That is exactly what's going to happen. And I mean, I get that maybe they didn't quite understand everything. It's easy for me to look back and to say, you know, how can you not get this? But it seems to me plain the plan that Jesus told them the plan that we're going and, and there is this celebration, but dark times are going to come. And when those dark times came, what happened? Jesus was crucified and everybody deserted him. Nobody stayed with him. Nobody stood up for Jesus. Nobody spoke out. The crowd did not have his side, even though when he enters into the city, it would seem that the crowds love Jesus. Christ was betrayed, as he said, but more than that, Christ was abandoned, and there was nothing they could do to stop it, but how many left him? And even Peter, who said he would not let Christ die, denied Christ. So one of our lessons that we want to learn from this is not to repeat the mistakes of the past. You know, Christ had prepared those disciples, and as he did them, he also repairs us today. And it continues to do through, so through the Word of God and the work of the Spirit in our lives. Just like the disciples, we've received a word from the Lord. In fact, the Scriptures have, in their entirety, speak so much to our life and how we live and what we will experience and what God promises. And the Scriptures are pretty clear about the workings of the world. It's no question that God blesses us and He does so greatly and we have so much of a hope to look forward to. But... When talking about persecution or trial or tribulation, it's not a matter of if, but more when. And Christ even says so. A simple reading of the Beatitudes will show you, in Christ's wonderful sermon there, what we should expect with trial. We are blessed, though, even if we go through trial, Christ says. So in our joy, we celebrate, and often and we have been blessed many times with great prosperity and easy living. Even so, will we then repeat the mistakes of those before us when we come to celebration and enjoy it but fall when trial comes you know we are blessed always and we should always praise God no matter whether it seems to be a bad time or a good time you know blessed during times of plenty and during times of want I'm thinking reminded of Philippians in chapter 4 specifically and Paul talking about the generosity of, of that church and he talks about that, but he says an important spiritual concept. He knows that whether in hard times, financial or otherwise, that Christ is the one who gives him strength. And he can be strong, and in that strength he praises God. So, you know, whether I have abased or I abound, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, Paul says. And we need to understand that that should be the same for us. Though it's not always just about financial, it may be the otherwise. It may be we go through desperate times and dark times. We cannot repeat the mistakes of those who abandoned Christ during his time of need. That they were there for the celebration, but the crowds cheered against him during his time of betrayal. So we need to make sure that we take that opportunity not to... Uh, dis, you know, to, to uh, repeat the mistakes, but also to share in the victories. You know, despite all this rhetoric and, and the difficulty, we need to be able to maintain our joy. I want to emphasize this last point here as we come to it. We praise God no matter what, but this does not mean that we're always so serious that, uh, that we cannot smile, that we should be joyful and that we should 
come out in our lives. We need to be on guard and be prepared through the thick and the thin, yes, and to take time to celebrate. I mean, the triumphal entry really was triumphal. It was Christ coming in. Salvation was coming in. The King was coming in. The Messiah, the Son of David, was coming in. It is something to be celebrated. But we need to take time to celebrate. We need to make sure that the procession of Christ, you know, that might be tampered down quickly for them in that moment, it, it was a glorious time of celebration, and we should take care of that. You know, the, in another account of this, in one of the other Gospels, the Pharisees say, you know, you should tell these people to be quiet. And Christ rebukes them, saying, essentially, you know, even if the crowd were quiet, the rocks would cry out. That's how joyful of a time it was as he comes and he enters in. When we are living each day for Christ, there will be times of sorrow, but remember to live also in those moments of joy that they cannot be held and pent up. That we had a, a, a beautiful day just the other day. I, I don't know, you know exactly how today is going to turn out on Sunday, but on Thursday, for example, when I was finishing writing my lesson up, the birds were singing, the sky was blue, and nature was bursting forth in what I expect of spring. And when I got to the office that day, I made some phone calls. I could have done it inside. I could have just walked inside and been in the building. And you know, I usually stand there next to the door because I don't get good signal. But you know, I could have done it inside, but I stayed outside the building I even took a walk around as I talked to people on the phone because it was so beautiful and I didn't want to let it go to waste after so much gloom of the rain I had to take time to enjoy God's creation and we need to share in the victory of Christ and to take time to celebrate these victories these triumphs these times where Christ burst forth into the world and we take time to celebrate and enjoy the blessings of God I know that times may seem dark, but there is a lot of good that is in the world right now. And remember to share, especially today, this first day of the week, the time that we get to come and to celebrate God and to praise Him. Make sure that you celebrate the joy of the Lord. Because no matter what happens to us on this earth, what do we have to fear? We have to be vigilant against temptation, but if we have learned from the people's mistakes of the past, we can live full lives now and celebrate in times of trial and in times of great celebration and plenty. This morning, I know that maybe something I've said here today has pricked your heart. And if there is something that you need to do to make that right with God, give me a call, give one of the elders a call, give somebody a call and make it right today. I hope that this lesson has been beneficial to you and I hope that it will bless you throughout this week. Think about the times that are down and understand that even in spite of those times that we can share in the victories of the Lord. No matter what trials we, have, we may have that, that, that we can face it forward and, and look forward to the glory of God and the joy that we get to live with Him forever. At this time I'd ask that you please close with me in a word of prayer as we close out this series. Bow with me please. Our Father in heaven, Lord holy and hallowed be your name. We're so thankful, Lord, for this time that we've had to study a portion of your word and to learn about the entrance of Christ into Jerusalem and, and how people, perhaps maybe even though they didn't understand it, they were saying things that were so true, Lord. We're sorrowful at the betrayal of our Lord. We're sorrowful that he had to die on the cross because of our sins. But Lord, we're so thankful and so joyful for the fact that he did die and showed his love for us that, and yet that while we were still sinners, he died for us so that we can have eternal life, that we can have joy with you. Please bless us always and help us to remember this sacrifice. Help us to live lives worthy of it. We ask this all through your Son's blessed and holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen.